All right. I'm not sure if I speak more quickly or more slowly compared to Tina, but you'll have to tune your listening a little bit. So uh, next 15 minutes, we're going to go over uh, things that are sort of at least made it through phase two or entering into phase three and try to convey to you what, how these things work and what they imply a little bit about the pathophysiology of IBD. Here are conflicts of interest. And we'll talk about key classes of emerging therapies, and these include newer developments for anti-leukocyte trafficking antibodies, as well as anti-interleukin-23 antibodies. We'll talk about a class that we don't have any, uh, any existing agents in our armamentarian uh, as yet, um, which include the S1P1 receptor agonists, or sphingosine 1-phosphate 1 receptor modulators. This may be very unfamiliar biology for you. Um, what I won't talk about in this, for the sake of time are the Janus kinase inhibitors this morning. So uh, moving first to the anti-leukocyte trafficking antibodies, of course, uh, the grandfather agent of this sort was natalizumab. As we know from our experience years ago with this agent, um, it was not suspected, but uh, eventually became clear that this drug was associated with a uh, very high risk of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, PML, uh, potentially lethal uh, brain uh, JC virus infection. Um, this drug is still used fairly widely for the treatment of multiple sclerosis, where it is very effective. But it, while it's approved for Crohn's, it is abandoned in the use of IBD because of this very serious outcome. Now, over time, it's been learned that that agent, which binds alpha-4 integrins, and therefore will interfere not only with alpha-4 beta-7, it'll bind to that part of the molecule on leukocytes that bear it, it will also bind to alpha-4 beta-1. And therefore, alpha-4 beta-7, which is very specific, kind of a zip code on the surface of the cell that brings it into the intestine, uh, through, through binding of uh, MADCAM on the intestinal endothelial cell. That's fairly specific, but what is not specific is the interaction of alpha-4 beta-1 with VCAM-1, and that's present wherever there may be inflamed tissue in the body, including in the inflamed meninges, such as in multiple sclerosis. But also, that's going to interfere with uh, trafficking of leukocytes into the brain, and therefore patients are thought to be susceptible to PML and this is also true, of course, in Crohn's disease patients who are treated. So that's been abandoned. But, of course, we do have vetalizumab, and that clearly does not have an increased risk of PML. In fact, to date, there has been precisely one single PML case reported, and that patient actually had HIV, which is a well-known risk factor for PML. And really, no other cases have come to light. So clearly, natalizumab and vetalizumab are, are very different. It also provides justification for specific interference, um, not broadly of alpha-4 integrins, but of uh, more focused integrin interactions with MADCAM. So in addition to vetalizumab, um, which binds alpha-4 beta-7, you could bind the, the ligand on the endothelial side, which is MADCAM, and there's an antibody called on, on to, on tam, on ta, uh, I won't call it anything because I really have trouble with that name so far. It's a new name. Uh, and uh, I'll show you some of the data for that. And also there is data for etralizumab, which is an anti-beta-7 antibody, which will interfere both with alpha-4 beta-7 and will also bind to alpha-E beta-7. So those are the newer approaches. And we'll start with etralizumab, um, which is a humanized anti-beta-7 IgG1. And in addition to binding um, alpha-4 beta-7, uh, which will uh, prevent the uh, leukocytes that bear it from uh, making their way uh, uh, into the pyres patches, uh, as well as into the lamina propria in the bowel, um, it also will uh, bind to alpha E beta 7, and these are basically uh, lymphocytes that are on their way to the epithelium. Basically, they're intraepithelial lymphocytes, so alpha E beta 7 binds to E cadherin. So it's interacting in two different ways, which is a little bit different from alpha 4 beta 7's binding to uh, vetalizumab. So different mechanism of action, does that imply any difference in efficacy? And there is some reason to think that uh, they may be a little bit different. For one thing, 
alpha E beta 7 brings uh, lymphocytes into the skin as well. So you can imagine that maybe this will be better for the treatment of some sorts of extraintestinal manifestations, maybe in particular skin. Uh, but also, there's interesting biology that might make it more specifically effective for small bowel disease, and I won't go very deeply into this mechanism because it would be uh, too, too deep a wade into the pathophysiology. But what do the data look like? Um, so far we have phase two data in ulcerative colitis, and I'll show you Crohn's disease shortly. Um, this seems to show that the drug has some efficacy relatively similar to what we have seen with uh, vetilizumab. Um, interestingly, most of the effect in this phase two study is in the anti-TNF naive patients. We really don't see any significant difference uh, between drug and placebo in the patients who had failed anti-TNF. But another interesting aspect of this is there may be a predictive biomarker that you could measure in advance of starting treatment that might predict who is more likely to respond. So if you measure alpha E either through a real-time qualitative, uh, quantitative PCR from a mucosal biopsy in the bowel or by immunohistochemistry, you can see that the patients who have high expression of alpha E are the ones who seem to have much higher likelihood of response to this agent. So if this plays out, it could help us select who gets which agent, or, or at least this particular agent. Um, turning to uh, anti-MADCAM antibody, antimalamab is the name, um, but I'm not going to try to say it again. Um, this is, these are the data in ulcerative colitis. And these data are a little bit unusual in that they seem to show a bell-shaped response curve, which is uh, either spurious effect because the numbers of the patients studied are small or is something reflecting, uh, interestingly, upon the biology, we don't know. Uh, but it really does seem to show that this approach can be effective in ulcerative colitis and, uh, again, looks very similar to what we expect for the efficacy of, for example, vetilizumab. In Crohn's disease, the effect, efficacy is not as clear with this approach. Um, unfortunately, this is an older study and uh, plagued, as many older studies, by high placebo response rates, where the definition here is of um, remission, clinical remission, based on the CDAI and didn't incorporate objective outcomes, which we've learned to do in later studies. So we're going to turn to a different way of modulating trafficking of, uh, of leukocytes into the mucosa, and this is the biology that will be very new to you, which is uh, the sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor agonists. And uh, while you may not know this, these are widely uh, expressed throughout the body uh, and have a number of very important functions in brain vasculature, maintaining homeostasis in lung vasculature. Um, also, very importantly, uh, as a treatment, uh, in lymph nodes, it basically leads to uh, blocking this or, or actually agonizing it uh, leads to lymphocyte sequestration, trapping the lymphocytes, as I'll show you in a moment. But also, uh, these receptors are expressed in the conduction system of the heart, and this has implications for one of the important side effects, which is uh, conduction abnormalities or delay, especially on initial dosing, some bradycardia uh, that has to be titrated upward to avoid. Uh, and there may be some effects in kidney as well. So here's the physiology of all this. Basically, um, the lymphocytes in, uh, that are within lymph nodes rely on the expression of S1P1 receptor on their surface to find their way out of the lymphocyte. So when you bind it with an agonist, that produces internalization of the receptor, and therefore it can't really detect the S1P on uh, the vasculature, uh, lymphocyte vasculature leading out. They're detecting this gradient outward. And therefore, they become trapped in the lymph nodes. They're not dead. They're just sort of sitting there, not in circulation. And upon withdrawal, receptor expression is restored, and then the lymphocytes leave the nodes and reverse the peripheral lymphocyte reduction that is common to all of these agents. Now, we have an example of this with ozanamod uh, in phase two studies in ulcerative colitis, and without going too deeply into the details, you can see that this drug is effective in achieving mucosal healing and histologic remission even in an eight-week time frame. These are very few patients, and the study had prior treatment with anti-TNF, so it's on the more moderate side of moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. And this also seems to have a maintenance effect at least as far as week 32, better than placebo in the two different doses explored. 
and uh, clinical response also seen far out that way. There's a second agent called atrasimod, which is also making its way through clinical trials, fast on the heels of ozanimod, and this is in phase two that was reported um, about a year ago, and you can see that in these two definitions of outcomes, uh, basically the drug has efficacy. So this class clearly works, and these are only two of a number of agents in this class that are being developed. There are some potential safety issues with this, as I've already alluded to. Lymphopenia is a class effect, um, but interestingly, there's little, if any, known increased risk of infection despite this, and it's totally reversible. There have been some cases of mild transaminase elevation, but no liver failure. Uh, the cardiac conduction abnormalities are really on initial dosing, and therefore there's dose titration in the first day. We'll have to see about how much monitoring is needed with the first day of dosing. And one caution is that with fingalimod, which is the uh, grandfather agent that is widely already used in multiple sclerosis, there have been a number of cases of PML that have been observed, but the risk seems much, much lower than we have seen with natalizumab, but we'll have to watch for that. Turning now <clears throat> to the anti-interleukin agents, um, we've explored many different sorts of anti-interleukins, including approaches to block IL-6, which seemed effective but had a number of uh, potential serious side effects. We've also had approaches that have tried to block IL-17 or IL-17 receptor, and unexpectedly that actually led to exacerbation of disease. That's for very interesting biological reasons, which include that IL-17 is needed by the gamma delta T cells in uh, the intestinal epithelium, which maintain mucosal homeostasis. So if you block IL-17, you actually impair immunity in, in the uh, bowel. However, blocking IL-23, which we already do in part with, uh, with ustekinumab, which blocks 12 and 23, is an important uh, new pathway. And we do this by blocking the P19 portion, which is found only in IL-23, as opposed to P40, which is found in both IL-12 and 23, common to both of those. There are theoretical reasons to believe that this may be more effective than blocking both of those cytokines, 12 and 23, and also the safety, well, I think ustekinumab safety is excellent, but this may be even better. So here's what you see, that P40 is shared between 12 and 23, and if we block just P19, we have four agents in development, which include brazicumab, brazinkizumab, merikizumab, and gaselkumab. Those are easier to say. <laughs> brazicumab, uh, we investigated in a phase two study, and you can see here that even though this was a very small study, if you looked at clinical responses, um, this seemed to be significant. It missed significance for clinical remission. Um, but if we incorporated, there was no endoscopy in this, but if you incorporated biomarkers and looked for a 50% reduction in CRP or in fecal calprotectin, you could see that the placebo response rates went markedly down, and there was obviously a very large treatment effect. Also quite interesting is um, IL-22 is downstream of IL-23, despite the numerical order of those things. And if you measured IL-22 in the serum, it was actually only the patients who had high IL-22 who seemed to respond to this agent. So this offers potential hope that we may have another drug where there could be a predictive biomarker. There are three other agents, um, but two of them we have some data for, including rizinkizumab and Crohn's disease. And here you can see that over 12 weeks of treatment, um, either of these doses seemed uh, great in terms of clinical response, in terms of clinical remission as well at the two doses. Um, it looked pretty good, especially the higher dose. And if one looks at objective outcomes here, including in the middle endoscopic response, you could see 37% versus 13%, uh, which really looks uh, pretty darn good, actually, and maybe approaching comparability to anti-TNFs without, apparently, the safety issues of anti-TNFs. More recently, we've had the next one come along, murikizumab in Crohn's disease, again looking the, at the objective responses of a 50% reduction in the SCSCD. Here we see um, at the highest dose of 1,000 milligrams, 43.8% versus 10.8% on placebo, a really robust effect size, and in terms of uh, symptomatic responses by patient-reported outcomes or CDAI, also, the drug looks really, really good. 
And for the first time, also demonstrated was the efficacy of anti-P19 blockade in ulcerative colitis. And once again, you see very good rates of response and remission. Uh, here it's clinical remission, both in bio-naive patients and, as with all agents, lower but still significant remission rates in the bio-experienced patients. And here's maintenance data showing that if you continue treatment, uh, the durability of this also seems to be quite good. So we have a lot of interesting agents that are really close, I would say, within, some of them were within two years, um, some of them more like on a four or five year time frame. Uh, the different classes that have intense investigation include uh, newer approaches to uh, blocking leukocyte trafficking, uh, the S1P1 receptor agonists, uh, JAK inhibitors, of course, which we didn't talk about, anti-P19 antibodies, but there are many other fascinating things with completely different mechanisms in development. We're also seeing, however, a kind of plateauing of efficacy, and we're looking for ways of escaping this plateau and really improving on efficacy, and I think either combination therapy of some sort or the predictive biomarkers, such as the two things that I mentioned here, might enable a precision medicine approach. And then one word of caution, of course, these are all new. I think uh, really we have, we are never really completely 100% sure about safety of drugs until they make it into the real world and we start collecting lots of evidence on tens of thousands of patients exposed for years. Um, so it will be a while before we know everything about all these agents. So hopefully you find that interesting and take some uh, thoughts with you home for your own future practice. Thanks very much.